tactile sensations within the body. Beginning with these sensations of solidity and firmness where your body is contacting the floor. And then allow your awareness to be open and receptive and eliminate tactile sensations wherever they arise. And if among these sensations you notice any tension or any pain, Give it your full awareness, and perhaps it will self-release. Continue to settle the body in its natural state of relaxed ease, stillness, and vigilant awareness. Now allow your awareness to illuminate tactile sensations that change as the breath enters and leaves your body. And now apportion your awareness with your primary awareness aware of the very stillness of your awareness. As you maintain a peripheral awareness of these sensations of the breath. Your awareness is open and receptive. And able to discover tactile sensations, perhaps in surprising places of the breath.
where you wouldn't normally look for the breath. But your awareness illuminates these sensations without entering into them, without becoming fused with them. It is like a still candle, an unflickering flame in a glass jar. Only a metaphor. shift this 20% or your peripheral awareness from the tactile domain to the mental domain and know the breath directly. Maintain a primary awareness of the stillness of your awareness, the glassy calm surface of an immense body of water, for instance. While you maintain the peripheral awareness knowing the breath, Simply knowing that the breath is long or that it is short by knowing precisely the beginning and ending of each in-breath and out-breath. And now as you maintain a peripheral awareness of the stillness of your awareness, give your primary awareness to the space of the mind and whatever mental appearances arise there. Whatever appearance does arise, let awareness hold its own ground, remaining an impassive witness without preferring that that appearance be different, let it stay or let it go, just let it be.
Try to witness the entire life cycle of a mental appearance. As it arises, is present for some time. And if you can remain present with it, you will watch it dissolve back into the space of the mind from which it arose. Awareness has gone into motion in Shanghai, become cognitively fused with one of these appearances. Let your reflex be to release your grasp on the distracting object. Rejoice, ah, and loose it again. This is it. Return to the stillness of your awareness. And then remain attentive for whatever appearance arises, abides, and dissolves next. Try to tune up your introspection to recognize the precursor of grasping, which is preferring that this appearance be different. Just witness and let it be. Release, rejoice, return, remain attentive for whatever arises, abides, and is all sensed.
there any quick comments or questions about that? I got into a loop um, for a section on the uh, releasing, re like the precursor, uh -huh. seeing that I wanted it to change, and and it seemed to catch me as the object, like oh I'm doing that thing that I'm supposed to be doing, uh -huh. and that caught me for a little while, but I was caught in that not recognizing it as an object. It, it's what Shanghai thing. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. We will be going there also uh, because, as uh, you and Teddy both had noticed, there is fruitful potential in this meditation for vipassana, real vipassana, <laughs> and beginning to track down that self. That's the one that we are going to be missed by the end of the day if we had that one in our sights. I'm still having a, a little trouble distinguishing between the, when we move into like the mental awareness of breath, how that is different than the like conceptual designation that we overlay on the breath. You know what I mean? Like, is it, yeah. what is, what am I, how am I experiencing the breath as a mental sense? Do uh, you remember the terms of three-step dance of turning concepts into realization? Uh, Pre-conceptual, conceptual elaboration, and then post-conceptual. Mm -hmm. So this would be, uh, this knowing the breath, which would the, of those three would that be? Pre-conceptual? I think yeah. so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So it's like the, the life of the breath, like underneath the conceptual. Yeah, so it's in aware, you know how it's like a deer in the forest knows its breath, right? And doesn't require conceptual elaboration. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require, you know, a timer telling me that was a five second breath. Based on that data, I can infer conceptually that my breath was short. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the wheel was the revolution of the wheel. So preconceptual without a doubt. Okay. Thank you. When we're doing this practice, do appearances mean anything that's coming in through the five senses? Uh, no. So we're we're really working with just the mental of the six fields. So um, we are not you know, a sound happens. You, you can't not hear it. <laughs> you know, you know uh, so what you, but you, what you do is that recognize that uh, the sound as a men, as a auditory experience becomes a mental appearance very quickly uh, if we grasp to it and try to explain it, or get pissed off about that disturbing my meditation, or whatever. So uh, most sounds especially are the ones that are really difficult to filter, aren't they? Especially here. <laughs> uh, it, so things are going to impinge, but uh, we don't grasp to them. We just simply notice and and then, you know, the main event is mental appearances. And a mental appearance would be becoming upset about it or explaining it or, you know, telling a story about it, etc. So would you say, would you say it's like whenever an appearance, mental appearance comes, um, grasp into it is like uh, creating a meaning for it in any way. Like this this thing means something. Right? Something arises and we apply meaning to it versus just seeing it as something arising. Um, yeah, so grasping occurs in a continuum. Um, so the, the basic 
the most, and what the continuum, the poles of the continuum, would, you would say, would be benign and pernicious. So let's say the benign is, is Hannibal in the room now? What do you think? Yes. I think so too. Uh, to do that, to be able to answer this question, Stephen and I both have to, first of all, distinguish Hannibal from everything else in this room, from the Tonkas, from the floor, from every other person here. So that actually, that distinction of this from that, it would be in, in Tibetan psychology, a form of grasping. But is that the one that causes all of our suffering? No. I mean, that allows Stephen and I to converse and say, is Hannibal in the room now? And to get, you know, to exchange information. No problem. I mean, ultimate, ultimately, that one also will, you'll be able to see it as it happens. So not that it's a problem, but you'll be able to watch it happen and, and recognize that, oh, it's only a tool. It's not a natural thing. I mean, but I'm, I'm making, I'm using it. Um, so we're moving along then the, the realm to pernicious. And that then is the reification. So reification, that, that term, is uh, in psychology and philosophy, means that you are giving concrete, solid existence to an abstraction. You know, and that, so, and, you know, in Buddhism, that's, there's, there's no, in philosophy, nobody not, does reification and knows it like Buddhism. You know, that just becomes volumes and volumes and volumes. It's the whole program is recognizing when we are doing that, giving, con attributing and perceiving as an object, something that is only an event. Um, so simply recognizing, so meaning that was your question. That could be over, way, well over here on the benign side of, of grasping. And it's the, it, uh, and it just, so you recognize this appearance is my brother. That's no big deal. Uh, but, but all of a sudden then, the grasping to it, saying, you know, telling a story about your brother, becoming very emotionally involved with it, and going off down the avenue with it, is then that becomes the, the grasping that we're trying to address. For me, that appearance and the grasping happens so quickly yeah. that I don't, I, I can't realize that, you know, that mental, uh, well, more neutral ones, I'm able to slow it down. But for things that have a charge, yeah. I'm not able to, you know, have that precursor moment. Um, um, is it just practice? Well, it, it's a, it is a fire hydrant, right, yeah. to begin with, uh, especially the things that bubble up often have a, a powerful charge to them. And we are so habituated to grasping to them. So, yeah, that's why it's called practice. And um, yeah, retreat certainly is the setting in which to get three years worth of practice in a short time. At what point does does rejoicing? I was having a problem with with when something would come up and then being able to release it, but then I would get caught up in rejoicing it. That would kind of become an appearance all of its own. Yeah. Of like, yay, I did it. And I'm like, no, 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 stop thinking about doing it. Oh, yay, stop thinking about thinking about doing it. And then it's kind of like, like, stop doing that. Yeah, just stop. <laughs> Stop it. Okay. <laughs> it's only it's only an appearance. It'll change. Uh, 
And then, of course, the, the thing about the, the four R's, remember, are a, a tool. And remember when you get to level three of shamatha, where you're patching the gaps, meaning that you are able to return quickly. You're 51% of the time on your object, meaning that you are away from your object briefer and briefer times. So when you are able to, to do that, to actually patch the gap, because you still have, the object has some momentum, uh, then don't do the four R's, because that then would become a distraction, wouldn't it? You don't need to do the four hours because you were able to return. But it's when you've been Shanghai for a long enough time that you really just need to let's reset here. That's when you and and it's that the, the four hours are the way that you begin to build the synapses in those four distinct different parts of the brain that are all involved with the four different stages of being Shanghai and returning. All right. Yeah. Yeah, so the four hours would be appropriate throughout the day, because that's when we usually get into a shine. Yeah, wouldn't it? I think so too. So that is when the mind does begin to settle and you have these bigger and bigger gaps. I sometimes like I have trouble delineating um, this. Am I in the awareness of awareness at this point now? Or I, like, am I, 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 am I still in the space of the mind? Like, what is the difference? You know, is it subtle? There, there is no difference. Okay. So, yeah. The awareness and space of the mind are, you know, the space of the mind is a metaphor for the spacious quality of awareness. Of a story there. Well, let's. I, yeah. um, just to continue on that same topic, I found myself continually or habitually returning back to the mental awareness of the breath and those spaces. Uh -huh. How do you like let go of that? Uh, let go of the mental knowing of the breath. You don't have to. If that seems to be the uh, the only mental appearance that's arising. Are you preferring that it be different? Give me some juicy mental affliction to work with, will you? <laughs> <laughs> It'll come. No, so that's the thing. If, if yeah. it, whatever mental appearance, maybe it is only the mental appearance of the, of the breath, if that's still happening. That's a mental appearance, isn't it? Do I prefer that that be different? You know. And, and then along those same lines, when you have like physical stuff come in just for a moment, uh, yeah. I, I know Alan talked about balancing earth and sky or whatever. Uh, is that a, a di are you distracted if you take a moment to like, oh, I'm gonna just breathe into this or and just return, or is it just kind of keeping an expansive capacity? Uh, you might become aware of sensations of pain or something like that. Don't the, just recognize which practice you're doing. Okay. Yeah, and so it's not, uh, you know, you're not going back to, well, it, it, that's a, another long story because you can adjust your practice mid-stride also, but, um, that's more of an, a, a bit of an advanced element. So basically just recognize which practice you're doing. Things are going to impinge, sounds, tactile sensations. Uh, you know, and if you feel like you, you know, it'd be helpful to breathe into a pain or something like that, go ahead. You know, I mean, it's basically, you know, you know, be relaxed about the whole thing, obviously. But it's it's mostly what really the whole practice is about is mental appearances, and uh, don't grasp on to a tactile sensation either, like a pain, because that would and resist it, for instance. 
Well, let's take a Let's take a brief break. And while we are taking a break, I am going to challenge you, New Yorkers, to maintain silence. Because this, and take advantage of this day as, as an urban retreat, you know, meaning you are still in New York, but you are retreating. And you'll notice, because what we're going to do when we come back is go directly into a silent meditation. And so you will be doing yourself such a favor if you aren't chattering uh, when you, because otherwise, truly, the, your first 10 minutes of meditation will be continuing that conversation. Uh, and then you are able, because you are being silent, you are giving the gift of silence and allowing other people to just have what is probably quite unique in you, maybe in your life in New York, this uh, chill silence. I don't have to be anything to anybody. And I am attending to the space of my mind and mental appearances, even when I am not meditating. So let's take, try to keep the, the break brief, uh, but you know, Get comfortable, stretch a bit, uh, use the restroom. Let's come back in six minutes if we can. So 11:51.